Hello, and welcome to today's Type Directors Club Virtual Salon. My name is Carrie Hamilton. Today, we are delighted to be hosting a live broadcast of the public radio show Person, Place, Thing with Randy Cohen and his guest, the admired teacher, award-winning designer, and member and longtime friend of the TDC, Gail Anderson. We'll have some time for questions at the end of the talk, and now welcome Randy Cohen, host of the public radio show Person, Place, Thing, and his guest, Gail Anderson. Thank you. Hello. Thank you. Um, thanks so much for having us. Um, I know, Gail, you like further ado, but I say without further ado. Um, <laughs> I'm, I'm tired of being bullied by you already. Um, so, um, uh, who, who is your person? Well, my person. You know, I should say my sister, I should say maybe my longtime 30 plus years therapist. But uh, I'm, I'm going to go with uh, I'm going to go with with friend and colleague, um, uh, Stephen Heller is my my person, Randy. I bet everybody watching um, knows who Stephen Heller is, but explain to the civilians like me who who might not. Have. <sighs> if you're on this, you know Steve. If you've ever gone to the bookstore and looked for a book about design, illustration, popular culture, typography. It's Steve. Steve is author, editor, co-author of over 200 books about all of those topics. 200. Yeah. You know, I've, I, I don't like to brag, but I've read 200 books. Um, <laughs> not this year, but I mean, totally, totally. Uh, not, not about graphics, just I think in my life, I might have read 200. So Steve oh, Heller. I'm, I'm impressed. I'm Thank impressed. You. I'm trying to impress you. Um, <laughs> Uh, he uh, presided over the New York Times Book Review for many years, right? Oh, yes. Oh, yes. And Steve, you'd meet with Steve at 6.30 or 7 in the morning. He met with illustrators, with designers, so generous with his time. And we were working on books together, and I was still living at home, the first book we were working on, in uh in the Bronx with my parents and I would come down. He said, oh, meet me at seven. I was like, meet you at seven. And uh, you'd meet him at seven in the morning for half an hour. It's like, all right, see ya. It's like, okay, what do I do now? <laughs> Did so, you, was this when you were uh, just starting out? Um, well, yeah, I guess, I guess so. I, I knew of Steve through his wife, Louise Feely, the fabulous Louise Feely. Um, she, I uh, worked, again, for not, the civilian side, I mean, she's oh. also a designer, yes? She is beyond a designer. She's an uber designer. She's she's the most elegant designer. Uh, beautiful typography, beautiful everything. And Steve, I was at Random House then, and Louise's office was around the corner from mine. And this is right when I, I was just out of school. And this guy would race around the corner in the evening and look in and never really say anything, but just go by. I was like, who is that man? And that was her boyfriend, Steve Heller. And um, and I, I was like, oh, wait, Steve Heller. Like, I know that name. He'd written, you know, in the teens at that point uh, of books, not not in the hundreds. And, and I would look at his books. I would read his books. And I thought, oh, what a, what a great, like, you know, fabulous design couple. And um, when I was working in Boston uh, a year or so later at the Boston Globe, I I mentioned to Louise, if gee, if Steve ever needs help with a book, I would love to love to work with him. And then I got to know him when I was at Rolling Stone. He got in touch. He needed help on a book. And that was 30-something years ago. So you've known him for your entire professional life? I have. I have, yeah. With the ex uh, Yeah. Of 30-something years, 35, 36 years of doing this, I've known him for... 32 of those, 33. So, yeah. yeah. Was it weird going from um, you being a novice and he, he being someone who hired you? He was your boss to being was colleagues. Uh, I mean, when I first met him and, and would go over, you know, again, as I said, living at home, come down into the city, go meet him before work. I was so intimidated because he was so smart. And, you know, he was in the Times and had this crazy office with all this stuff stacked up. And, and he was just, again, so brilliant. And he knew everything about design, design, history. And 
he would say stuff and I'd write it down, but I, I didn't even know what he was talking about. And then I'd have to go and look it up after. And this is, you know, pre-internet. And I was like, I'd get a book and figure out those words he was using and those designers he was talking about. And, and I enjoyed working with him so much. And we just got on so well that we kept collaborating and, and, and sort of became friends really quickly. And it's been nice to sort of be part of the family in some way. Uh, do you, does Steve have um, a, an instantly recognizable style that a civilian like me would notice the way, say, Milton Glaser does? Like even I, I, I go, oh, that's Milton Glaser. Or, or, or is it more diverse than that? Well, for Steve, he's, he's writer where Louise is designer. Oh, okay. um, so you, Steve was an art direct, was art director of book review, but I would, I wouldn't really say designer. His his talent in that role was making incredible illustration commissions and uh, finding young artists just out of school. They that was the first person you went to see. You went to see Steve Heller and try to get a piece in the book review and and uh, yeah. So he he was guru for so many artists in in their first work. It's unusual in other fields for a practitioner like him um, to also be a kind of theorist. And, you know, he has the role uh, of a historian and a critic. Yeah. Um, does that account for his um, influence over the whole field? Yeah. And he, I mean, he is design history. He has it all in his head. Uh, even now when we work together, I'm looking stuff up and he just, it just comes right out. He, he's he's probably made the rest of us kind of lazy in a way because he's got it covered. Uh, he's, he's covered all of design history. So we're all just all sitting, you know, waiting for him to do another book uh, or, or write another article. He, he does a piece for um, uh, print magazine, the online, uh, now an online design journal, and it's the Daily Heller. So he does something every single day about design, every single day. So. Uh, and is he generally read by um, his by practitioners or yep. and, and what about um, non practitioners? Does he write in a way that someone like me could understand it? The, like the little the little words for you? Yeah, you I prefer mean, the, the little words. words. <laughs> All right, so, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> um, yes, because it's it's a lot of pop culture, and uh, and I think that you would you would really enjoy it and. Since you've read two hundred books, maybe uh-huh. one of them was even <laughs> maybe one of them was even his at some point. You didn't even realize it. I, when you say Steve to students, they're like you get a little question mark sometimes. Then you start to, you know, rattle off some of the titles and like, oh, I have that, I have that too. Like, yeah, that's all that guy. That's that one guy, Steve. So, I, and I he's like-, like just this, you know, I mean, he's brilliant, but really sort of accessible. Once you get past that initial intimidation of oh, he is design history, you know? Uh, so. Uh, I like the idea of, of people who have this enormous influence, um, both over their profession, fellow professionals and the entire vis- visible world, but that um, someone like me, until you said you were going to talk about Steve Heller, I did not know who that was. Mm-hmm. They're like these invisible presences that yeah. are, have such a profound influence on, on everything I see and do every day. Mm-hmm. And he's just been this one constant through me uh, that two sort of threads through my entire uh, my entire career and a lot of ways my entire adult life. So, uh, you know, I he's passed on opportunities. He's helped make me confident as as a writer. And, you know, I love that he's sort of brilliant, but insecure, you know. He's sort of a Woody Allen character. Oh, so and... you can exploit that. That's good. <laughs> yeah, you need something. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So. yeah. Um, as I understand, um, when he first started out, he wasn't at all sure that um, this was going to be the kind of work he did. And that um, what he went to military school and, and didn't pursue an art education at first. No. no. And, uh, and he... Um, you know, was art director of Screw and I think like the New York Review of Sex or, or something like all this crazy stuff at the beginning of, of his career. 
So he's got this really great pass. And the military school picture is just fantastic. So okay. it's like the last person I would think of in a uniform, you know, standing well, at attention, Steve Heller. So uh, does he have good posture now? Not especially, no. See, no. you know, so. you lose it. Um, <laughs> Uh, but is, do you think there's something to this idea that um, you start out and you gain some experience of the world before you find the work you actually want to do, and then you're able to apply some knowledge of life to that work, and it makes you better at whatever it is you do? Huh? Uh, yeah, and for, for someone like that, he sort of found this thing that was uniquely his and, and has just really built on it and built on it over the years and loves it as much now. Working on the first book 30 years ago, uh, pre-internet again, just making Xeroxes and sending faxes to people and calling them, um, to now doing everything digitally, uh, it, it's still the same joy for him at the end of the process when we get the book. We, there's wow. one that's, that we just got last, last week, actually, that'll be out next month. And at the end of the project, when we get the book, it, the inevitable, what's the next one? What are we going to do next? I'm like, no! And then I'm like, okay. So the work just keeps going. It keeps going, yeah. And so every, you know, for every year and a half, every two years, every three, we do another book. And that's just been... Right. Um, is there something to, um, when you were describing his early work with uh, doing uh, Screw and the New York Review of Sex, um, I remember Screw as being kind of ugly, but maybe I'm just too conservative. Um, um, that he he entered the field when there were thousands of these things, and you can explain to young people what this is, called magazines. <laughs> um, and, and they had uh -oh. this enormous amount of graphic content. And and um, could there be a Steve Heller now, now that that's all gone? Oh, yes. They just exist as influencers now. Uh, that, yeah. They, they, yeah, they exist in social media, uh, but there, there are people who are, uh, who were doing uh, amazing startups. Um, there are entrepreneurs, uh, design entrepreneurs. Um, and Steve just created this space for himself that, uh, that he's occupied and, and is always so nervous about and just like, oh, am I relevant? Like, what are you talking about, man? Uh, and just the one who appreciates everything and who shows us everything and that we can look every day and see what he's collected. And that's the other thing about him. He's the collector. And so that's part of it for me is that I've got that same kind of gene too. So, you know, I would go over, he had a separate apartment just for the collections, just for the books at wow. one point. But what's yes. in the collections? What kind of stuff? I mean, there were mini mannequins, uh, uh, this Mao collection, all of this Nazi stuff, uh, uh, work that artists have given him. Um, just these, you know, he would go to the flea market on 26th Street and just keep sort of building up these archives. And then they've become books, of course. Uh, the mini mannequins were, uh, were a little mini book. Uh, they are truly like mini mannequins. They're scaled down. They're really cool. What are they used and, for? Um, you know, I, Designing I don't for know. very, very short people. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and I it's would go to his... <laughs> Little tiny stuff. These, these were the these were used professionally in some field. Yeah, yeah. We don't know what. I you know now I don't know off the top of my head, but uh, get we'll him on. See, He'll tell we'll you. See yeah. you later. Um, so, but I, I like the. I'm surprised that you're not. You don't seem at all nostalgic for um, the lost world of magazines that was so. Dumb. Oh no, I am. I am. Are you kidding? If I, oh I yes, 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 yes. I want to reduce you to tears before the end of the segment. <laughs> Um, and you seem just so, there's always something to design and the designer just has yeah. to respond to her world. Yeah, yeah. I I was actually just judging um, a, a design competition around magazines and it made me really nostalgic for magazines. Uh, and I, I have a pile here from the judging that's like, well, now I'm going to keep these forever, like everything else. And it's a much smaller world than it was so many years back when I was doing it. And I... 
I, I miss it. Um, I, I, yeah, I'm totally nostalgic for that. And I, okay. in teaching, if you, if you, if you ask students to design a magazine or bring in their favorite magazine, uh, they'll bring in a catalog sometimes. It's like, that's not a magazine, that's a catalog. Sure, so but, no, it's, okay. you know, uh, I don't want that to be lost on students, how wonderful that world is and that it's, it's smaller than it was, but it's still there. And for designers, what an opportunity, you know, and you're doing something all the time, which is what's great about a magazine. Well, I, I like your way of um, tying together the current, current practice with the history of the thing. Um, and and that kind of leads us into your place, I suspect, um, where, where, where this kind of uh, expressing these kind of ideas can easily be done. Um, so what is your place? Oh, no, I'm sorry. Where is your place? <laughs> I learned that from one of the 200 books. Uh, you know, somebody just said the mini mannequins were used for store displays. Oh, like, that's right. That's right. Like, duh. Yeah. The okay. little book, mini mannequins, the little, his, I... I'm going to find you a copy. It's Thank you. Book. Were they tiny little stores? <laughs> stores Where you had to sort of crouch down to go in? <laughs> yeah. Is that, is that oh, this whole hidden world I knew nothing about? Uh, uh, very small right. world. Small world, okay. yeah. Oh, thank oh. you for that. <laughs> oh. Good resist. Okay, so. Okay, so uh, my place. Yeah. Again, I could have, I was like, should I have done my Seton Avenue, the block I grew up, the house I grew up in? I'm like, eh. But I've actually spent more time at SVA, at the School of Visual Arts, than I have <laughs> anywhere else in my life and certainly in my career. That's another thread uh, that, that's, that's gone through the, you know, from 18 to now, uh, which is now 40 plus years uh, when you do the math. Uh, Okay, we can take a moment and we can <laughs> do math and get to fifty-eight. And uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, it's it's been the thread of of um, of of aspiration, of hope, of of uh, what I could be, what I could do, um, what I wanted to be. Just uh, every you know, I, I I say this not wanting to speak as somebody like I peaked in college and that was it and it's been downhill since. But I think not. But, yeah. <laughs> but but that's how I sound when I you know when I hear people talking about their college, like oh please. But uh, since I've been I've been teaching there for thirty years now, uh, and through the various jobs I've held, I've always taught. Um, People I had as instructors way back 40 years ago, um, uh, Paula Cher, people like that. Um, oh, she's done our show. She's great. <sighs> See, there you are. Yeah. Uh, you know, that's, uh, yeah, I learned, I learned everything there. You know, school was so different and I was, you know, kid coming in from the Bronx, getting on the five train going in and then eventually being a pioneer uh, when they had dorms uh, as an RA, living at the oh. Y on 34th and 8th, between 8th and 9th, Sloan House, uh, being involved, uh, really um, enjoying the experience and wanting to be part of it later and give back and all that stuff. Um, you know, it's this quirky institution uh, and it's, it feels it's sort of family run in, in a way. And so, and it really feels that way, even as it's grown and grown over the years. And I, I now work there full time. And so, you know, so I'm done and that's it. And yeah, right. Sure I off to pastor, put out to pastor yeah, after right, that. Right. Uh, but you know, I've come, I've come full circle. So well, I do see a, a connection between um, your affection for Steve Heller and your affection for SVA in that both of them were a part of your entire professional life, your entire yeah. adult life. And you seem to really like that um, continuity. Then it also embodies a, a change in you. And you. Yeah, sort of growing up with both in, in a way. And and now I actually work professionally with Steve because Steve also works at, at SVA. Oh, so. man. It's just getting together. Yeah, uh, but but um, that that kind of having a home base um, yeah. for, for many years and having people that remain um, uh, a part of your life for many years that that's it seems increasingly rare. I, I mm -hmm. envy that of you to have both. Yeah. 
Yeah, I mean, I've gotten to know Milton Glaser by being part of SVA. Yeah, now you're just you know, and you're just no, I am totally bragging. I, I am totally bragging. He's Milton, 110 now, right? Milton's no longer with us. But if he were, if he <laughs> were. <laughs> Milton lived yeah. down the road here for me. Yeah? Oh, I and, didn't know that. Yeah, and he he suggested the person who should build my house and he picked the colors and wow. you know like stuff weird like crazy stuff like that how would that have happened in my life otherwise uh through sva through so SVA. Yeah. Um, what are your students like um i <laughs> i haven't seen them in a while since they've just been in their little boxes but the students um are <sighs> ambitious and hardworking and uh, all that good stuff, but they're also kids, and I forget that. And now, as I'm so much older, when I first started teaching, you know, I was just a couple of years older than them, and mm -hmm. now it's like I'm older than their parents, and they're kids, you know. And I forget how young someone is who's 19 or 20, and they think they've seen everything, and you know, it's like you're you're so young, and so they're still so impressionable, and even even when they think they're so mature, uh, um, and some. Are, and sometimes the unexpected ones are the ones who sort of come back as these super achievers. Um, and you don't know who it's going to be. You know, is it the quiet one oh, in the back? Is it the obvious one? There, there are some that you're like, okay, what are you even doing here? Like, you're amazing now. Just go get a job and, and go get many, many jobs. And others who, it, you know, it takes a while. And I feel like I was, it takes a while. I was, I was good, but I wasn't, you know a star and, but I was a hard worker and I love finding those people who it's like, okay, I know a little rough around the edges there and, and to watch them really um, do so well uh, in the, in the years that I, I have, I've had folks who, oh yeah, you taught my mom. I'm like what? Wow. Oh yeah. That, that happens. Sounds a like a compliment, but really. Yeah. But like, do the math. Like, you're just yeah. like, I couldn't have taught you. Oh, no, I could have. Yeah. So. When I was writing the ethics column, people would say, um, My parents used to really like your column. And I, oh. right, just thank you. Thanks for that. <laughs> I feel so much better knowing that. Um, <sighs> do, do, uh, do, you, do your students this, know the history that you were describing that you and, and Steve Heller take so much pleasure in and, and, and help preserve? Do they come in knowing the history at all? No, they don't. No, they don't. Um, because their worlds are, you know, as big as the screen and, and uh, Instagram and Dribbble and whatever else they look at. And so we really push the design history stuff. And when they look back, they can't believe it. It's like there's all this stuff. For you to to steal from, you know, for, for that's, you to that's the motto it's the of the truth. school, is it? Yeah, yeah. And the role of education. <laughs> exactly. There's just right. there's all this inspiration, you know, that's that's not just on Instagram or on Pinterest or wherever. And that's we, we want you to understand your history and where where you've come from, so we can build on it. And and uh, and so that that's been really fun to watch their their little heads explode when they see stuff that's like. How old is that? And, uh, you know, they, they know art history a bit, but they don't know design history and advertising history and, all, and history of typography. So they're blown away when they see beautiful letter forms, when they see, they see beautiful alphabets and type. And uh, we just did a lecture in my last class on Tuesday um, about type and, you know, like, boom. Okay. Um, do you think part of it is the failure of our curators, that there are um, any number of wonderful museums where you can go and look at art and, and you, you, the history becomes your history. But um, uh, I have a friend who, whose career was in advertising and uh, she's pushing for, um, we need a museum of advertising. Um, and, and we need, uh, as we need a museum of typography, um, why aren't there such things? Well, there's a well, there's actually a museum on 23rd Street Poster House. Um, that's a right, poster but that museum. just opened up like five minutes ago, didn't it? I know, but it's amazing. Is it great? It's totally great, and it's like just the right size. When you once you get downstairs, you're like, okay, I'm done now. It's just enough museum, mm -hmm. you know, upstairs, downstairs. It's where TechServe was, and oh, they're yeah. wonderful people. They've got a great gift shop, and it's posters. <laughs> You know, it's a design museum. Come on. And it's a, no, it's in right. bite-sized morsels and just, 
it's wonderful. And we need more of that. And I love that that's so close to school that we can like go down there. Go, oh, go, so you, go. You take the- Send the well, kids I never got, we got, got to once before the pandemic. Right. Right. Um, uh, but we were supposed yeah. to actually do a show there. And again, the pandemic. Um, uh, but so this is very specialized. They're, they're the yeah. history of the poster you'll get there. But that's sort of a great way to do a museum. So that's where mm-hmm. we want our um, history of typography museum. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, yeah. We need rich people, I guess. Um, we do. Yeah, underwrite this or a decent society, but I wouldn't, you know, wait for that. Um, uh, and Museum of Advertising, would you support this? I would support this. Yeah, yeah. because a- in advertising is so much bigger than you know what we all think it is of of being TV commercials and print ads, and uh, it's so much more interactive. There's uh, there's just there's so much more. There's so much sort of um, helping people to change and make better decisions. And it's, you know, in my head, it's bewitched still. Wait, you know? Do you mean of make better I... decisions like I should buy, by buying a Pepsi instead of a Coke? <laughs> yeah. Is that the kind of advertising? Buy Colgate instead of Crest. Or, well, yeah, right. It's but it's, it's so much like, it's so much more than that. You know, it's not, yeah. it's not Darren Stevens and Larry Tate and, and cocktails and, you know, so yes, let's, let's, let's do that museum too. Well, it's a kind of, I guess, museum of uh, American culture in general. Is that Boom. where we're going with this? Boom. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. You fund it. I'll design something for you. I'm, I'm there. Yeah. Anything that starts, <laughs> I fund it is doomed. I can tell you that right now. Um, do you, um, do your students ever ask moral questions? Like, are, are there posters they wouldn't design? Like if the Mussolini team came and it was, you know, 1940 and said, oh, we want, you know, uh, some nice graphics for Il Duce. Um, do, do they, do these questions even come up for them and does SVA help them grapple with them? The questions come up uh, more and more for instructors on what are people's uh, sensitivities and, and what do we not want to talk about? What do we want to talk about? What do we want to, how do we want to push them to, to do uncomfortable stuff that challenges them uh, yeah, it's it's a it's a big topic. So, and, and uh, because of Zoom, now we have these faculty meetings where we can talk about that in little boxes together, which has been great. Yeah. So, yeah. Huh? Um, have you ever turned down a job because um, you said I just don't want to work for this product, this person, this? Uh, when I worked at Spotco doing um, theater stuff. Every now and then there were shows that were like, yeah, not so much. Mm -hmm. And so, so I've, so yes, indirectly. Mm -hmm. Um, And there've been a few projects here and there that I'm like, yeah, that doesn't feel right. Mm -hmm. Uh, And I think, oh, am I going to be doing a lot of hand wringing about this later? And nope, I'm good. Yeah. No, yeah. Yeah. It's really hard to work um, it, when life is essentially a freelance life. To, I'm so, uh-huh. I was so superstitious about turning down any job, any time. I could kill that guy. It's just one guy. Yeah. I, I'm not gonna, you know. But I, you know, you turn down one job, you'll never get another job ever again. That yeah. you, you yep. would mock the gods. Yep. Um, but I wonder if part of it too is that um, you are who you are and people know you and they know your work and they don't offer you the job. The Mussolini team wouldn't come to you because <laughs> they go, well, she's, you know, she's just wrong for us. <laughs> wrong for us. <laughs> um, so we don't, we're not put in that place. Life spares us from having to make those decisions sometimes because we're overlooked. We wouldn't even be considered for certain things. But I agree that there have been times, particularly when I was solely freelancing, that I think if I say no, no one's ever going to call me again. Like I've right. said, everything. Uh, that's that's scary. So. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, I like the idea of um, SVA as a kind of home base for you. That you've been there longer than you've been, yeah. and then you've lived in your house. You know. Yeah. That, um, huh? and, and that I wonder if it, in some ways, is akin to um, when New York was organized more around professional districts. Like, well, we still have a theater district. And you get to see all your colleagues because they're working on a show, you're working on a show. Uh, is SVA like that for you? It's like the theater district yeah. of graphics. Yes, yes, it is. I never thought about it that way. But That's yeah. why I earn the big money. Uh, yeah. <laughs> um, um, uh, there are people who've, 
uh, who've taught for as long as I've, you know, who are still teaching, who it's like, wait, I had you as an instructor. You're still teaching. That's, that's amazing. Uh, that, that it's the same family who's owned the school. And I know, you know, I remember seeing David Rhodes when I, the president, when I was in college and he was so young and I was like, that's a president. Wow. Uh, and, uh, Tony Rhodes, the executive vice president, people, I feel like I grew up with them too, in a way. So. That's pretty great. I'm pretty. Yeah. Jealous. Um, be. let's talk a little about your thing. Uh, your thing? Oh, my thing. My thing is many things. It boils, it's sort of office supplies, but it comes down to notebooks and pens, really. But we can, I suppose, broadly say office supplies of some sort uh-huh. of, of wanting to still be able to write and write on a nice, in a nice book uh, and use a good pen and um, I've gone through so many books over the years and have been loyal to one kind and then oh, what kind? cast it aside and moved on to others. Um, right now, uh, and it's been for a couple of years now, there's a, a brand called Baron Fig, uh, ironically created by an SVA uh, design student. Uh, so it, all, it really all does kind of come back yeah, around. Yeah. And uh, and I love these notebooks and pens. Uh that Joey Cofone has created. And I think, well, you know, what am I going to do with an, to me, an expensive pen, a $60 pen, and I'm going to lose it. Like, nope. I'm going to like never let anybody else touch it. And I'm going to have it in a little stand on my desk. Like I've got one in my hand right now, actually. And oh, wait, I, hold it up again. It's just this really simple pen. Uh-huh. And I've got a bunch of them and a ton of these notebooks that again, it just, cause you get to write so you know, for so few moments a day sometimes that having a good pen and a, a good notebook uh, means the world to me. And these Portuguese uh, books, Emilio Braga, there's another brand and, and they're a little expensive, but also very, just feel good, uh, a black wing pencil. Um, I'll go to, I have a bunch of erasers. I like a Pilot Varsity pen as well in black so I can get the illusion of a fountain pen. Um I used to buy these oh boy notebooks, uh, uh, these Japanese notebooks that I liked a lot um, and um, field notes and just, you know, there's, there are little books that go in my pocket. There are books that got like a little other case on it. Every book serves a purpose. And I mean, they're even right behind me now um, for the barren do, big um, ones. Just, what are the purposes? What do you do with these different, what do you do with well, these notebooks? Well, there's one that's in my pocket for when I go shopping uh, to remember what to get. So the obvious kind of notebook. There's a notebook for um, uh, podcast ideas. Uh, there's a notebook for SVA stuff. There's another one for student stuff. Mm-hmm. Uh, and um, there is one that in my room that I would try to write down one good thing from every day. Um, just just something to keep me going of, yeah, like sort of what good did I do today of like something that happened that was, uh, yeah, so there's, there, and again, you know, it's like, well, I've got to get this kind. And so now I get it. Well, I need like 10 of them because they might stop making them. So I should have maybe 15 of them. Well, no, I need the whole, all of them. So uh, and, well, they do stop making them, and that always seemed like a, a failure of uh, uh, consumer capitalism. That once I find the, the kind of sneakers that I really, really like, five minutes later they're going to stop making them. Mm-hmm. So why is it, why is that good why, from their point of view? Huh? Like I would keep so buying I, these. I've got so many Allbirds because I discovered these are the most comfortable shoes shoes ever, and I'm never going to wear anything else. So I've got enough to last me forever in case they ever go out of business. So it's the same with the notebooks and the yeah. pen. Like, I'm ready. When you shifted your loyalties from one sort of pen and notebook to another, uh, did you notice a, a change in your thinking or does it co- correlate with a change in some more profound part of your life? Um, uh, sometimes it's been a job change. Every job gets a different kind of book. So uh, I abandoned the, the, the old boys. They stopped making them. So there was that. And I had my last few. And then I was like, okay, I'm done here. On to something else. New job. And so 
not that I've had that many jobs over the years, but each one has gotten its own uh, style of book. And the little Muji books, the inexpensive Muji books, uh, were sort of the throwaways because no book, the book can't be too precious. So I'm not afraid to start a new one, you uh-huh. know? And I was in Italy and bought these beautiful, you know, Italian notebooks that you wrap the string around the leather. And I just can't use them because they're so nice. And I can't start it because, you know, it might so have the, no. Is, is this all, are we saying that your relationship to a notebook, working in that notebook is a kind of thinking? Yeah. So it's just yeah. recording something that when you pick up that pen and that notebook, it's a kind of thinking and it changes from job to job or part of mm-hmm. your life to part of your life. Mm-hmm. And then there's like, is it a pencil or is it a pen? What what am I using? And if it's a pencil, it's got to be a nice pencil. So, and, uh, and, and, and then it comes down to, well, now I've got to have a good pencil sharpener because I want a certain kind of point. Like, like it, I go down that rabbit hole. So, is this, are, are you unusual among your colleagues for this? Uh, or is this, uh, no. kind of, this is what designers do? Yeah, we're kind of all like that with something or some things like Steve and his mini mannequins or, I don't know, everybody's got their stuff. But the, the books, the books and the notebooks and the erasers and the pens and the office supplies in general have probably gotten a little out of hand. So. I don't know, unless you've had a rent. Um, some sort of warehouse space. I think you're doing fine. Um, <laughs> There's so like it brings me joy, you know. In the end, I'm for joy. So, yeah. um, you see, you did seem slightly nostalgic about this, and I wondered if that was because because you had said. Um, there's only a few minutes when you, each day when you get to write in this. Um, is that because you're working online more? You're mm-hmm. working digitally. Yeah. Yep. But I always, you know, when we were in buildings still, I always had a notebook and carried around the notebook and the pen and in a meeting would take notes and actually refer to my notes since my memory's so shot now. But, uh, you know, there are more times now that I open up a Google Doc and put notes in there. You do. So. Do you think, um, and I'm guessing your students overwhelmingly work digitally. Oh, my goodness. do they have notebooks and pens that they carry? I actually made notebooks for them when we were still uh, in the buildings uh, for my design thinking class. I We designed a design thinking notebook. I was like, you're going to write things down. And they're like, what? Like, can I just bring my laptop? Like, nope, you're going to write it down. And I brought them pens. So they were just like from Staples and the, the cheap pens. But it's like, you're going you're gonna to use your hands. People, you're going to write. You're going to write. And I think that they really started to enjoy it after a while. And we're going to so, go back to it. So. so when, but you're pushing them to do this is a way of saying that um, to do things with your hand gets mm-hmm. you to different places and different ideas. Absolutely. And different kinds of design. You're really thinking, you know, as you're writing. Uh, and some, I mean, some are sketching and using a book for that, but I'm asking you to write and to, if you see something, write it down. If you are reading about uh, a designer or period or whatever, write it down. It's gonna, it's gonna stay. It's gonna stay in your head a little longer, um, and it's fun. And uh, yeah. So if I'm if I'm here at home, uh, I have the notebook open, and I I'm writing in it probably half the day, but not all day like I used mm-hmm. to. Uh, but I, I mean, I'll never run out, <laughs> but if I ever did, um, I would, you know, use the paper from the printer. I would like, I've, yeah. So you will always work by hand. Yeah. That's part of your day. Um, do you think you could tell looking at um, their work, um, what was done by hand and what was done on a screen? Yeah. Yeah. And, and in the end, everything, especially now, um, has to end up on a screen. Uh, and so things that, uh, um, we were encouraging them, print it out, print it out, look at it. Let's look at it on the wall, print it out. Like, Oh, not this year. Just show it to me on screen. So hopefully we'll get back to that. 
you know. Why I, I see why you want them to do that. That the physical object is a physical object is different from something on a screen. And it changes mm-hmm. our relationship to it. And we think about it differently. And um, if you touch it and if you move your arm, but why do they resist it? Uh, because they're not used to it. They've never done it. Mm-hmm. You know, I want them to see type, the, the relationship uh, between the, the text and the headline. I want them to see how big the type is, how legible it is. And everything looks cool on screen. And then you print uh-huh. it and it's like, oh, not so much. Or that's really uh-huh. tiny. You know, they like everything really tiny. Uh, And so much of their worlds is on a screen. And so much of what they'll ultimately design uh, lives on a screen. But there is still print design. And I still, I still, if you're designing a book cover, I want you to print the book cover out. If you're doing a magazine, I want to see the spread. Um, I I want them to to realize there are these, this other world, this other world of print that's still... um, and will always be viable. So that's interesting. It hadn't occurred to me um, that the screen would be seductive and misleading. Or did you say everything looks good on screen? Oh yeah, because every the colors are bright and the, oh. I know. And they'll sometimes work on their laptops, and instead of making things bigger, they'll pull their heads in closer to the screen. <laughs> and you're like, come on, just make it bigger. And <laughs> So, uh, you know, this is the stuff that just fascinates me because that's how they've grown up. So, like, buy a printer, buy a printer, buy a printer. So so you have to urge them to buy printers. Yeah. Why would you buy a printer? Yeah. I'm so old. Isn't that crazy? Yeah. Yeah. I'm even saying just buy a black and white laser printer. You don't have to buy an inkjet or, or deal with all those, you know, the expensive color cartridges. Just get, just look at it, print it out. And Uh it's hard. it is hard um, to change your habit, mm-hmm. to change your way of doing anything is really hard for anybody. Yeah. But they're young. They're supposed to be flexible uh, and, and right? bullyable. You have, you know. I mean, think of how we had to change our habits to, to learn to do everything on screen, you know, when we were. Oh, so. true. And when I started out, yeah. um, writers did everything with typewriters. And I lived through that shift to the computer. And there were serious conversations about the effect that would have on the, on the writing itself. And mm-hmm. and the and it was they weren't foolish conversations because nobody knew. Yeah, and that was design. I there was a computer class when I was in school. I was like, I don't need to take that. Like, eh, maybe down the road or something if the computer thing <laughs> sticks. And I didn't take it because it was like, <laughs> who knew? But luckily, I took personal typing in high school. That's right. So I can type. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, do do um. Graphic designers get endorsement deals. Do people at SUV or your colleagues have you ever like? Do they are they asked to endorse a pen? A pen. <laughs> they design the pen. Uh, people end up in crazy places. These design folk. The designers are celebrities now. So I think so. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, I know that um, uh, for a while um, when when Remington first came out. Um, this is, we're talking about the middle of the 19th century, that uh, they started using, um, they gave one to Mark Twain. They gave a, an early typewriter to Mark Twain and he hated it. And he sort of fobbed it <laughs> off on other writers. Um, and he had to take them to court and ask them to stop using his name in the typewriter. <laughs> I mean, that could happen to you with notebooks. Uh-huh. Or, or it could be great. I know, um, also, um, I, I could have sworn I saw an ad for Ernest Hemingway for a pen. And I, I poked around in anticipation of our conversation. I couldn't find it, but I did find that he did um, ads for Ballantine Ale. There you go. Are you getting any liquor ads? <laughs> no, there's no justice in the oh, world. Or so, someone, right. you know, at our Museum of Advertising, when, okay. when you give the um, inaugural address to open the joint, right. I bet the endorsement deals are, are going to flow. <laughs> um, if I had a I'll notebook, I'd ask you to endorse it. Even though I, maybe you'll, but you're too fickle that I know in, in a year you'll switch to another. Network. No, it's never a year. It takes like a decade. So. Oh, I yeah, yeah. For that, um, we should uh, we should take some questions from from the folks watching. If if people have questions for Gail, just uh, type them into the Q and A box. Um, I love this one. Ah, here's one. It says, um, you started as a student, then got to work with your design heroes and had them become colleagues and peers. How would you advise aspiring designers um, to, um, to tame the intimidation factor and the imposter syndrome? Uh, you know, 
For all the fancy people I mentioned, it's rare that you ever really feel like colleagues and peers. You know, uh, even with Paula, who, again, I've known forever now, and she's like, just give me a call and, uh, and I'll, I'll, you know, walk you through this or we can talk. I'm like, is it okay? I'm like, oh, Paula, you know? So, and with Milton, we would have lunch um, every semester at these last couple of years. And I was still just, all, you know, awestruck. He'd say, well, you know, what would you like to have? I was like, I don't know. He's like, we'll have pizza. And <laughs> what kind would you like? And then he would decide. And then he would cut the pizza and serve it. And what what would you like to drink? We're going to have this. And, you know, I just was like, oh, I'll eat whatever. And I remember drinking something that I really didn't like once. And he's like, you don't like this? I'm like, yes, I do. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and uh, yeah, so I guess in, in they become your colleagues, but they never become your peers. You're always just a little in awe. But that said, um, people never hear enough nice stuff and and they're much more insecure than you would think. And so don't be afraid to reach out. And certainly don't be afraid to say, to send somebody a note just to say that you like something that they've done. Um, that still feels so good after so many years because we're also sort of beaten down from clients bringing on only the bad news or oh. whatever. So when somebody tells you something good, you're like, oh, thank you. Thank you. Oh. And now when a student writes a note at the end of the semester to say, you know, we know it was a hard year, but it was really like, <laughs> so, yeah. you know. I don't think anyone gets through life and at the end they say, you know, I've just had too much flattery. I have too much <laughs> I'm so it's true. Of it. Uh, but I think of, of my heroes as living a life entirely of praise. But no, huh? <laughs> um, I do too. I do too. Yes. Yeah. And maybe for Milton, maybe that's what it was, a yeah, whole life full was, of praise. Yeah. But, we but you're really <laughs> yeah. uh, Here's another one. It says, um, uh, from another designer of Caribbean descent, uh, what advice would you give to younger designers of color who deal with imposter um, syndrome? Again, imposter syndrome. Oh, man. The design that's, yes, that's the thing that we, we all feel like uh, we have to work twice as hard to prove ourselves, you know, and I've, I've gone through a whole career of that as, as a designer of color, as a woman um, of color, just feeling like I've got to work 10 times as hard to prove myself and keep up. And maybe that's what's kept me going uh, is that worry that somebody's going to be, somebody's going to think something was given to me just because. And I go into that with everything still, even now uh, as an adult, as, as an older adult, that there's still moments of like, was I chosen just because? And and that never goes away. And you have to get to a point where you're thinking, you know, instead of why me, of like, why not me? You know, like I've worked really hard and uh, maybe that's like 40 years of therapy kicking in finally after all this time. But uh yeah, it's always, for us, it's always about the imposter syndrome and wondering and looking and being in a meeting or at a company or in a at an event and thinking, am I the only person here of color? And that still happens, you know? So is, is the field um, not getting more diverse as rapidly as it should? It is, it is, definitely. But it's still, uh, yeah, it's it's getting there, but... Um, and maybe it's a younger person doesn't feel it as much as, as I do. And it's not like it's, uh. but, uh, so I hope for a younger person, it is a different experience, but for someone of my age is definitely, you know, in the classroom, uh, at various jobs, you're, you know, you're sort of the only one or one of two or, or three. And there were, yeah. I had a friend when I was at the globe, Richard Baker and uh, another friend, Steve Nelson, and that the three of us were together, other people wouldn't come over sometimes. They're like, oh, we're talking, they're talking about black stuff. And we're like, what? Like, we're just talking. Oh my God, really? And I know what you know, you're talking about. You're talking about pens. <laughs> you're really talking about notebooks. Look, so, look. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So there's there's that. So that that stuff is still uh, there. And uh, so uh, yeah, but I, I hope that, you know, that in the way that Paula made it easier for women in design, that I hope that I can, as well as some of my peers of my age, make it easier for people who are still asking about the imposter syndrome stuff and 
are they the only one in the room? Because I don't think they will be for the younger, yeah. the younger folk out there. Oh, well, that's heartening to hear. I'm glad yeah. to hear that. So you can really see a difference in the room yeah. from when you started and, and when you look out at the room now. Absolutely. Yeah. But, that's you know, good. there's still a way to go. And, yeah, yeah, and yeah. they're all now we're looking in, you know, I was only thinking about my community. And now I think of so many other communities of people who are feeling underrepresented and that we're now paying more attention to. So, you know, there's so much to chew on now, so much to think about and so many people who who need to be at that table and deserve to be and should never feel like am I am I here just because, you know? Yeah. So um oh here's another question. Um uh, what was working for Fred Woodward at Rolling Stone? Oh, you know, he was on my list as my other person too. So it was like oh, yeah? oh, oh yeah. Oh no, Fred uh, yeah. Fred has been part of my life. Fred uh, is a design legend and is a a great guy and like a big brother to me. And um, someone again who I still like. What should I do? And uh, and we talk and we text and and uh, I learn every every good habit, every good thing I learned professionally about design really came from him and from a woman named Lynn Staley, who was the art director I worked with at the Globe. From Fred, I, you know, learned to always sort of push people forward and to, um, if an opportunity came along that seemed uh, wonderful for them to not try to hold on to them, to say, you should pursue this, you know. Um, and not keep them in a job that they like, but when there's something else that they might be better at, uh, learn to to really love and care and nitpick typography, you know, to do typography. amazing. Yeah, all comes back to type and letter okay. spacing and and his fussiness and also that he, if you were in a slump, he didn't hold it against you. If if there was one person doing tremendous work of the group of us, and it wasn't you, you didn't feel like like oh why not me or um, it we didn't praise one person's work or we praised everybody together. And that was, that was really wonderful. And, and cause we were all so young and it would have just broken my heart if it was a job where you were like trying to get his, you know, uh, I like get on how his much radar. Of, uh, so. What you learned from him is about um, who you are as a human being and how to deal with other yeah. human beings as much as with um, details about, uh, about type, although type is important too, but it's, yeah. you're mostly speaking about human lessons, whether it is to be a human yeah. being. Um, yep. Yeah. And so, you know, Fred, Fred is still one of those people for me who uh, he's a very elusive designer. So people can't track him down and have him do stuff and all that. He's sort of stayed under the radar these last couple of years. And now he's out in, um, out in California and uh, out in the desert, uh, sort of retired and taking pictures and doing all that. But yeah, someone who just loves magazines, loves design, uh, and is just a, a good egg. So Well, and speaking of magazines, here's, here's a, a magazine <laughs> question. Um, it says, um, we still go crackers for magazines in the UK. And, and they still say crackers in the UK, by the way. <laughs> um, uh, one type notes, um, I, IDN, and we're encouraged to subscribe by our university lectures too. Um, print is still strong. Do you think there's a US-UK divide? Hmm. I don't think so. I don't know. No, no. I think I think we're as much in. I think we're as much in love as you are. Uh, <laughs> so. Ooh, yeah. I like it. I like your we're hackles. Are just ever so yeah. slightly hackled. Um, <laughs> oh, uh, here's one. Uh, a more general one. If you haven't already done it, what's your dream design project? Huh. Well, the dream design project was doing the postage stamp, and uh, oh, and it okay. just somehow just say what the stamp was. I I designed a stamp for um, the 150th anniversary of the signing of the Emancipation Proclamation, and I always wanted to do a stamp, and I wanted to be one of those people who helps to pick the stamps, and that's what I get to do now. So, so cool. again, huh? So that's that's like yeah. I mean, it doesn't get cooler than that. This little no, tiny thing that. That yeah, so I love doing things that are just sort of out in the world and become fish wrap. 
you know, things that aren't too precious. So, yeah. but are, are out there. You're like, I did that. I worked on that. Or to see a poster in the subway station, like I worked on that, or I know that show, or yeah. And well, seeing I, Rolling Stone, you know, when it was out there was really cool. It was just like just part of the world. Right. In a way that I don't think digital is. That um, when I you walk down the street and, and that you you designed or <laughs> put physical objects out in the world and you walk down and there's like you're on the subway and someone's reading a magazine and you and that's your page. I just think yeah. that's so great. I'm with you. Um, I'm with you. And then I have your book. I have your Ethicist right. book upstairs. Oh, oh I, I just meant, I thought you were speaking in general. No, no, no. I just mean that for right. when, when you, I was just like, oh my God, where'd you go? Like that but, book, I mean, that yeah, call, that's all nice. You know, like think. that's part of the world, you know, yeah, that's so cool. And it cool. is, and I feel yeah. great about it, but it, but it's no cereal box, if you know what I mean. Uh, yeah. Or, yep. or a thing, <laughs> it's the thing that's modest. You don't even notice it. It doesn't call attention to itself, but it, it cumulatively, that's the world we live in, these objects. Yep. And, and somebody someone, designed it. I remember being a kid and realizing, wait, an actual person had a design that it didn't just, it's not like a rock or a tree. And that just yep. seemed insane to me that yep. you got to do, someone got to do that. Yep. That was uh, 16 in spec magazines when I was a kid. They yeah. came from 7, 745 Fifth Avenue uh, and had Michael Jackson and Donny Osmond and the Partridge family and everybody oh, on the cover. And then yeah. when I went to work at Rolling Stone, I worked at 745 Fifth Avenue. Boom. I, so I've, I've been really lucky, you know, that I've had these sort of full circle moments that I was like, who gets to do that? Like, I want to make that. And it's like, I got to make that for many years. And I got to meet David Cassidy when he came to the office. All right. That's it. I, I mean, All I right? thought we had time for one more question, but just so David... You got to meet David Cassidy. You all of us, Perfect. all of us who were of a certain age, even then, when he came in, we were like, hey, we, we were beside ourselves and he, he was so flattered and we were just, yeah, David Cassidy. So. Wow. Um, thank you. We're not going to do better than that. So it's time to say goodbye. <laughs> Stop. Um, thank you so much for talking to us today. <laughs> Um, someone did fun. ask um, when the um, transcript and recording will be up, and and I'm not sure what uh, the TDC is doing, but I know for me, I'll edit a radio version, um, and that'll be on the air in about four weeks. And if you on our email list, you'll know when. Otherwise, we won't tell you. Yeah, of course, <laughs> about four weeks. Uh, thank you, Carol. Oh, thank you. This was fun. Okay, and just to just to pee back onto that, uh, the TDC will have it available through our website, um, which will take you either to the TDC YouTube page or the TDC Vimeo page, and that'll also be in about a month. Um, and it's available for the first thirty days to members only. Ooh, Ooh yes, it's that's great. pretty cool. I'm going to join as soon as I get off of this. I'm joining. Awesome. Ooh, Carol, <laughs> Carol, he's joining. Got that? Yes. <laughs> I have to say thank you. Thank you. So I really enjoyed it. It was absolutely wonderful. Thank you so much. Thanks for again. having me. And thanks for, I mean, I just am grateful for the chance to meet Gail. <laughs> right back at you. Right back thank at you. you. <laughs> All right. That was a wonderful talk. Thank you both so much. Um, just want to mention everybody about the conference again. Right, Carol? Right. We'll see you next Friday and Saturday. And remember... Going around the world from A to Z. I'm really excited about that as well. Okay. So really, thank you, Randy and Gail. Oh, my God. It was fantastic. I loved it. Next time live with a band. Yes. Okay. Yes. Mm. Yeah. Mm. Gail, you were supposed to have that, but. I have a band. A band that knows Partridge Family covers me. Really? <laughs> <laughs> I know someone now who can get us David Cassidy, if I understand. <laughs> Get Tony. <laughs> Bye. 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 Thank you. Bye-bye.